Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'll continue a story that we started to hear this morning. Uh, my goal uh, will be to show you that, in effect, uh, we can, when we analyze an image, uh, we are really uh, doing quite an elaborate question and answer session on the image. And before we get to the actual image analysis, I'd like to indicate that what we used to do for image analysis can actually be done for any, uh, any database. So think of a database as an Excel sheet, or think of a database as a questionnaire in which you have a, a lot of observations or a lot of people, and for each one of them, you have a list of responses. Uh, you can think of an image as a questionnaire in which uh, every pixel is being interrogated and you get all kind of answers for the pixel. And I'll give you several examples later. But my point is that when, and this is different from what we heard uh, yesterday and today, is that the, when you have uh, data which usually is viewed as documents or points in RN, and coordinates are various attributes of the documents, really coordinates uh, of, a, of, a, of a set of, so you have a collection of points, say, in Rn, and you have the coordinates. Each coordinate is really a function on the set of points, right? So if the set of points is not organized linearly, it's, although the coordinates are linear functions in the ambient space, they're not linear functions on the, on the object that you're looking at. So we have a situation, uh, usually, when we have a data set and we have coordinates of the data set, we also have all the coordinates are functions on the data, and they carry information. Those functions are linked to each other. They're not independent in any sense. If they were independent, there's nothing to say, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the data set cannot have any structure. The, the point is that if you want to analyze uh, data, you really have to analyze both of them simultaneously, and that's really the goal of this lecture, and then I'll, gi I'll give you a lot of uh, different examples to do that. So uh, this, this course, uh, kind of vocabulary, uh, this is sort of motherhood and apple pie, as they say. It, the point is, I, I want to really blend and merge together uh, ideas from uh, usual signal processing and show you that if you have a da a, a, any database whatsoever, you can, if you reorganize it correctly, you can actually signal, do signal processing on the database as if it were an image. And I'd like to illustrate that on, 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 on some examples. And in that, in that work that one does, uh, you actually use ideas from conventional harmonic analysis in the sense that you will have wavelets, you will have smoothness classes, you will have Bessel spaces, and all of those things will have a different incarnation, if you wish, in this more uh, abstract context. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is, is really my, ob I'm, I'm going, let's think of this as an initial challenge. I have a very structured uh, matrix here. So I have this structured matrix down here, and somebody uh, just permuted the columns and permuted the rows, and this very nice structure uh, was converted to this uh, seemingly uh, disorganized structure. And the issue is, can we easily do the inverse problem of looking at that, organizing the columns and the rows in such a way that we recover this, this original structure? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples of that. Here is a typical example of that. Uh, so here I have a structure which is given to me. This happens to be a questionnaire. So 3,000 people were asked, each one of them was asked 570 questions. And the database, uh, including all the responses of all the people, is here. Of course, the people are coming in random order and the questions were given in random order. And so what you see is basically, uh, essentially, something that looks like random garbage. 
but not completely. I mean, so you can think of a yes answer as being a white spot and a no answer as being a black spot. And so it's a binary system, if you wish. And the question is, can you put some order in it? And what you see here is some reorganization in which uh, what happens is peoples were put together in groups of people with similar profile. Questions were put together in groups of questions with similar profile. And you see that in this particular box of, of the data, for example, everything is pretty well defined. If I wanted to denoise this thing, it's, it's quite clear how you denoise an object like that. I mean, it just converted to a barcode. And uh, that's, that's, so you know, in particular, you would know that in this region here, if you have a black spot, it's inconsistent with what you would have. So the question is, so that's one thing. The other thing is that the model, so this is sort of a noisy version of the real world. You would expect that the way you want to think of this is think of the following. This is person I, and this is the responses of person I, this particular column. And this, if this is question J, this is the response of person I on question J. And you would expect that response to not be deterministic, right? It depends what you had for breakfast and all kinds of other things. And so let's say you, you answer 90% of the time, you'll answer yes, and 10% of the time, you're in a bad mood, you answer no, right? So you think that the, the underlying model for such a questionnaire would be that there is a probability field uh, line here, which is person I has a probability PIJ to answer yes to question J, right? And so you expect that, and so the, the, you, you, what you want to do is recover that probability field out of this picture. So you want to say the profile of person I is a list of probabilities of responding yes to the corresponding question, right? And you expect this probability field, if, if there's any justice and you have organized the world correctly, then you expect that you will have some metric connecting people so that the profile that of people who are nearby each other will be similar to each other. And you'll have some way of linking questions so that with a metric between questions so that, uh, again, relative to the question metric, you also have some smoothness. So basically, you want to get a probability field out here which would be smooth relative to the two metrics. So viewed as an image uh, will be a smooth function on that image. Okay, so just to, sh to give you an example of an artificial model like this, so here is an artificial, oh, sorry. Let me go back. So the artificial model here is the following. I start out with an image, which is up on top. I think of this as, so this is a, a function taking values between zero and one. And you, you think of it as generating a binary field. So for each point, for each pixel out here, uh, you would, uh, uh, this does it again, okay. So for each pixel out there, basically what will happen is that you toss a coin and you either get a zero and a one according to the probability of the value of the pixel, right? So a pixel defines a probability and then you toss, you toss a coin, you get, a, you get basically uh, a, uh, a field. You, it'll look like a desert version of the same image, so it's not even pointed out there, right? If you, want, you had to send a fax image of that, this is how you would desert it, right? And, but the point is, then you permute the columns, and you permute the rows, and what you get is a, the pictures that looks exactly like the psychological questionnaires that we have seen a minute ago. And the question is, can you recover the picture? And the answer is, I'm going to show you how you actually do it in a few minutes, okay? It's not very difficult. And, and so you recover it, and, and you get from the, from the gray lab, from those two intermediate images, you get the original one down there. So not only you need to recover it, you need to find what the permutation was that makes the whole thing work out. In this case, uh, things are relatively smooth uh, to begin with in X and Y. In the situation that I have people, uh, people are not indexed by X, right? And questions are not indexed by Y, right? There's some geometry of people, which is whatever the geometry of people happens to be. It's not that complicated, by the way. 
and geometry of the questions, which depends on the design of the questions by the psychologist. And uh, what we want to do is uncover that, uh, that thing. Here is another example, by the way, where machine learning actually is usually going to fail, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm showing it, but there is another motivation for it. If you were to do the same thing, so take a function like sine kx, right? And uh, again, permute the rows and the columns, and uh, you get this sort of noisy dot pattern. And your role here, you, what you want to do is actually recover the x parameter as well as a k parameter out of it, okay? So you can think of this as, so the mathematical problem, which is, by the way, a problem that has been uh, bothering the physicists for many, many years, is think of, suppose that you have some, you know, you know about the x geometry in this case is very, is easy to recover because I'm cheating. And I will take, so for example, 512, uh, uh, no, I'm, 1,024 x samples and 512 k samples. And so you have that the different rows are actually orthogonal to each other, but the columns, are only orthogonal to each other if they differ by two, or by, uh, and if, they, if you look at a column and you move one column up, you go from x to x plus one over 1,024, uh, then it's not, you don't have orthogonality, so you can easily change the column and discover the x geometry. So you have the x geometry, now you have those functions sine kx, they are orthogonal. What is their geometry? Everybody is at the same distance from everybody else. You don't even know what geometry means, okay? By the way, that's a problem. I, I was really talking about physicists, and it's a problem that's going to come up later. You have a manifold. You have eigenvectors of Laplacian. We have heard about this quite a, a bit today. And you ask, how close is one eigenvector to another? Now, if you ask anybody, well, they're close if the eigenvalues are close, but the eigenvalues could be the same, and the eigenvectors could be completely different if there's some multiplicity. So the geometry of the eigenvectors, uh, the, which is a dual geometry of, of the underlying space, is not obvious. And what I'm saying is, if you view each eigenvector as a question, if you wish, on the, on the points, uh, you can do it. Okay, and that's, that's the point. So you can do it in a way which is dual to whatever geometry you have on the point. So if I wanted to organize, say, uh, spherical harmonics or eigenvectors on the torus or eigenvectors on any manifold in the geometry that tells me how, how similar they are to each other, uh, I, I can do it, but I need a notion of similarity that's not just autogon not Euclidean. So that's another issue. So what I'm saying, is you can view sets of functions on it, on it. so you view the functions, the function sine kx as functions of x, then you have a collection of functions. Uh, they can be organized depending on how x is organized, and you can organize x by using the, the function themselves. This is why this is sort of a dual system uh, of organization. <coughs> so the, the simplest way of, so I'll, I'll give you a, a very short overview of how you organize columns and rows of a database. Let's say the questionnaire that we had. Uh, another example, by the way, that is good to think about because intuition is rather clear. Suppose you have a collection of text documents, and for each text document you have a, a list of, uh, if you wish, again, zero, one. You have a list of words, a vocabulary, say, of, say, 10,000 words, and for every word you just Say, if, if the word is present, you put a one. If it's not, you put a zero. Or you, you can be more sophisticated and write down what is the probability of finding the word in the given document. You can do that, too. But zero, one works so fine. So you have a collection of documents, a collection of zero, ones. It looks like that. Now what you want to do is, is organize the documents by the commonality of vocabulary that they have, by how similar they are in vocabulary. But and, and then you also want to organize the vocabulary by their co-occurrence in the various documents, okay? So two words which co-occur a lot in the same group of documents, like biology, uh, must have sort of related meanings or related content, if you wish. So again, so the way we, we organize both sides of this array, if you wish, 
is by saying I'm going to, to initially build a, a graph on the columns of the matrix by say, essentially uh, defining the similarity between two columns by taking, say, cosine of the angle between them, so taking the dot product, or taking uh, any, any, any metric, but only allowing for things which are very close to each other to be linked. And then, uh, once I've done that, I build a graph on the, on the columns. I could, at the same time, build a graph on the rows, but I'm saying, so, so, so suppose this were a document or this were people, and I organize people because they mostly answer the same questions the same way. So two people will be uh, linked to each other as being similar profile or the same cohort if, uh, say, 90% of their answers concur, concur, okay? And otherwise, I don't, I don't link them. So now I have a network of people uh, where people are, are linked if they basically respond in the same way. Once I have a network of people like that, I can use the, this network of people to define cohorts or people with similar, similar profile, and I can use this to build a, a metric between people. In any case, I define groups of people. Now, when I look at the questions, I can take two questions and define similarity between the questions by how, how concur I mean, basically, how, how often does it happen that the same person answered this. If I know the answer to one, I know the answer to the other, if you wish. Okay, so I basically look at, co if it's documents, is how often did this two words, two words are similar if they co-occur 90% uh, of the time together, so they, I will link them. And that will allow me to group words into uh, groups of keywords. Not, they don't have similar meaning, but they are keywords in the sense that they occur in the same documents. Uh, very often. So sometimes it's called bag of words. So I can <coughs> basically organize one and the other. My point is that <coughs> all of that, if I, st if I do that and stop there, I will get garbage. I mean, that usually does not work. Because uh, you, need to, you need to filter things. You, you don't, I mean, the response of an individual to a given thing is not necessarily good. And I will uh, explain this in a few minutes in terms of what is called earth mover distance, and uh, we, we, will, uh, we will do that. So <clears throat> what is the challenge? The challenge is that if I want to compare, for example, so let's, let's return to this example of text document. And <clears throat> suppose I have two documents and I match them by their vocabulary. Now suppose one document was written by one person who likes certain words, and the other one by another person who does not like exactly the same words, but he uses words which have basically the same meaning, and so the two documents basically say the same thing with completely different vocabulary. Then in my, in my notion of similarity between the words, uh, they will be very far away from each other. I will not be able to match them. So I really want to be able to match the two documents by saying I'm allowing to take words from one document and substitute them to the other document, provided that there's not too much of a meaning, uh, of a change of meaning between that, and then I will <coughs> basically be able to compare words, by, uh, compare documents by the meaning of the words being, uh, being used. And so for that I need a distance on the vocabulary which involves meaning. So I need, a, I need to invent, let the data invent for me a distance which is uh, a, a, a conceptual meaning, uh, conceptual distance between words. Similarly, if I want to look, if I, if I have two words and I want to understand whether they relate to each other, I, it's not good enough to see whether they co-occur in the same documents. What's really important is that if they occurred a lot in the same topic, then I know, let's say, they relate to biology or physics or mathematics or something like that, and I have a much better understanding of how the words are related to each other than by looking at individual documents. So this is another operation of filtering. By the way, in two minutes you will realize that this is deja vu all over again, in the sense that anybody who has done signal processing has been doing this kind of 
you have two signals, you when to compare them, you do a low pass filter on one, low pass filter on the other, you compare the low pass version. And that's exactly what we are doing here. So, <clears throat> so let me tell you uh, this, what I was trying to explain is something called uh, the earth mover distance. That's a distance that's used by uh, people in image retrieval uh, to match images and allow for distortions of the images not to really affect too much your, uh, your trouble. So for example, let me s skip one here, just a minute. I, I, want, th I want this image. Let's say uh, <coughs> I have those different curves, the red, the blue, and the green, and I want to measure the distance between them, okay? So what, how does one do that, okay? One thing you could do is <coughs> do what Stefan was telling us this morning, which is apply this uh, scattering transform and measure the distance of the scattering transform. That will work very well because you can deform one, one curve to another curve with a small deformation, and that's fine. But you don't have to go that far. It's much easier to do. And the easiest thing to do, so the simplest thing that uh, what, is what is related to Earth mover distance, which I'll return to in a minute, is say if I have the red curve <coughs> and the blue curve, and I can match a point, I can find uh, for each point on the red curve the nearest point on the blue curve and try to do a matching which is one to one and, and then <coughs> take, uh, take the, measure, the distance to be sort of the average uh, length of all those matches, average perturbation I need to do. That would be one way of doing it. Of course, it's a pain. And to do that, you, have the, you could define the distance between them as a minimum over all, all, all such correspondences, and you're in deep trouble because it's too much of a computation. There's a simpler way of doing it. Take each one of those curves and blur it, okay? Just take a lousy pair of glasses and look at them. Then you don't see the difference, right? And so and depending how blurred they are, it will tell you really what the distance is, okay? Uh, when you, you start, to, the moment you start to differentiate, then you, you will see it. So the easiest thing to do is take each one of the curves, convolve it, say, with a Gaussian at some scale, uh, then take the L1 distance between the fat curves, and then do it again on a different scale, take the L1 distance between that. So now you have L1 distances between fat curves at different scales, and you can weigh it by uh, scaling the fat curves higher than the low curves, and the scaling power that you take will tell you what kind of filtering you're doing. So that's a very simple way of doing things, and that's something you can do in the context of data, and that's, that's my point. I mean, I don't need curves or anything. All I need to do is look at things, blur them in some ways, and compare them. Or if you wish, if I view each curve as a measure, so arc length on the curve is some measure, the, the distance between the measures is two if the length of every curve is one. So everybody is far away from everybody. That's a problem uh, <coughs> in general. But once you fatten them, they're not so far. So you're allowing for perturbation. This is a, uh, a version of the so-called earth mover distance. So let me tell you, uh, this is designed to compare, say, signatures. So for example, uh, here, If you look at that, you say, let's say you are measuring some sort of uh, <coughs> uh, return, and so you have those bins, and you look how much energy you, you have in each bin, and you want to compare energy profiles, right? So if you compare, uh, if you look in, in the L1 sense, uh, the distance between A and B, or in the L2 sense between A and B and so on, those distances have nothing to do with what you expect. This is obviously the nearest to that. This is quite far. And comparing the distances in conventional sense doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, you ask what is the least amount of uh, energy I need to transfer, say, from this picture to, to get this picture, then it's clear that it's a little amount. All I have to do is take some from here, move it here, some from here, move it here, and then uh, those two will match. Uh, this sort of minimi minimization problem, comparing two histograms, which is every bin is, has a certain level of energy, I compare the bins, is, is, is earth mover distance. It's a minimization problem. It turns out that the dual problem 
is, is a maximization problem, which is uh, if you let P to be the, the difference between uh, <coughs> the two histograms that I have from here and there, uh, then uh, you ask yourself, what is the minimum work you have to do to move from one to the other? Uh, it's the same as a supremum uh, over all function f satisfying the constraints that f of x minus f of y is less than, say, the distance between x and y or the cost of transition. And uh, you take the soup over all f satisfying that, you're guaranteed to get this distance, which is earth mover distance. Now, the beautif beautiful thing about this, it's much more interesting than that, okay? Because, first of all, uh, <coughs> If you take this CXY to be the distance between X and Y, uh, or you take the distance, uh, then this means that this function is holder. And if this function is holder, the dual, this is just the, the, the compu computation of the linear functional norm of the difference of two measures on the holder space. Uh, it's very easy to compute. Uh, if you know anything about the characterization of holder space by wavelets, uh, wavelet coefficients are bounded, so the dual space is L1, so it's very easy to compute. And what I was telling you before with L1 distances between blurred version co is completely equivalent uh, to doing that. The other thing is, and there is a lot, a, a generally a mistake in most of the literature, uh, it's not e easy to compute if you take Euclidean distance, but if you take Euclidean distance to any power which is not an integer power, you can compute it easily. Okay, so there is some real mathematics, okay, that the, whole, the, whole, the Lipschitz space and the Holder spaces are not the same. This was discovered by Zygmunt almost 80 years ago, and it makes a big difference in the constant that you get and how accurate you have and so on. For most of those things, if you want to compare two objects, you don't care if you have the distance or the distance to the alpha, where alpha is 0.99, right? Uh, and, and that's, uh, on the other hand, People fight uh, against logarithmic constant. Okay, so here's an example. So here you have, uh, this is uh, an image. Those are images, for example, of, of a truck going around it, a, a trail. It's, a, it's a, done at night from far away, and you see as it changes its shape. It changes, and you want to track it as it goes on the track. And so you, you can measure, if you measure Euclidean distance, it, it's, it becomes very far away if you take this Earth mover distance, it changes gradually and nicely. And uh, the difference between this sort of wavelet-based distance or dual of, or, or by a blurring distance that I described before and the, the actual optimization distance is, is negligible and it works just as well. So the point is, it's infin it's, uh, the Earth mover distance is very simple to calculate. Uh, it's a dual distance to some nice space of functions and and uh, I'll get back to that uh, a little bit later, so. In any case, coming back <coughs> to this uh, business of how do you organize the database, the, the point is you organize the columns, you organize the rows, and you, when you do this organization, you build a tree, uh, you can build a tree on the columns, which I've built here, uh, by grouping columns which are very similar to each other into groups, you can build a tree on the rows, and we will see examples. And then when you have that, you have the ability to, when you have a tree, you always have a metric. And when you have a tree, the metric uh, related to the tree is uh, very often the, the lowest level uh, of the tree. Let me go to, to, to in, this is a much nicer tree here. So here, this is a tree bu built on the, uh, on the psychological questionnaire I had there, and this is a binary tree built on the psychological questionnaire. This binary tree is very easy to build uh, in the following way. Uh, what you do is you take all the questions, you <coughs> build this affinity between people by saying two people are linked. If 90, they agree 90% of, of their responses are the same, and then you make, uh, you make out of it a Markov process, you find the top eigenvector of that Markov process, which is not equal to one, and that top eigenvector is positive and negative. Where it's positive, you take the 
right hand of the tree, where it's negative, it's the left side of the tree, and that usually corresponds to an approximation to the max cut of the population. In other words, breaks up the population in two big groups. And then you take each one of those groups and you do the same construction on each one and you, you generate automatically a, a data-driven binary tree. When you have a data-driven binary tree like this, you have automatically a metric uh, which de defines the distance. So each, each point here is a, is, is a person, okay? And the distance, say, between this person and that person uh, would be the, the level, it would be given by the level of the tree, two to the L, where L is a number of level, uh, uh, where, where, you ha where they are in the, same, in the same group of the, in the same folder of the binary tree. So this is a binary tree. You say the distance between two points is the size of the smallest folder containing them, if you want. This is a usual dyadic tree on zero, one. This is a dyadic tree on the people. But bear in mind, people are not dyadic, okay? And people are not organized on the line, but they're almost. So uh, anyway, what you see here is basically, this is a group of people. This is the psychological profile that somebody gave us uh, as an evaluation of those people. So this is a depression score, for example. Zero is a mean score for all the population. Uh, one, this is one standard deviation. And so those people are extremely well, extremely functional and quite uh, well behaved. Let me go back yeah, to the beginning. So this is a, another group of people here, which we will see in a minute. But so here I've organized the, the graph, okay? So the graph of this collection of people that I had, which uh, <coughs> we, we build, uh, is given by this surface here. So this is a two-dimensional surface, actually. This group of people here is the one that's uh, highlighted. And this group of people is extremely dysfunctional. It's opposite the one that we had. And really what happens is that this would be the first eigenvector of that graph is along this axis. Second one is here, third one is here. Turns, turns out the first eigenvector just measures how dysfunctional a person is. Okay, so all the dysfunctional people are out here. All the very functional people, which we saw before, are down here. On the other side, this is the, the group we saw just a minute ago. Those people are completely functional. Those people are uh, at the other end are dysfunctional. The people in the middle are in the middle. There are a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And uh, if you're interested, I can run it and we can do things. But I'll run, I run an image in a, in a, minute, in a minute, actually. So <coughs> the point is, that the demographic geography, geography of the people has been pulled out. And essentially, this is a dysfunction axis. And this is a very, some sort of, uh, sort of psychological variability axis. There's, there are several of them. As you see, I just display it in two, three, four. Uh, you, can you may have to display it in five or 10 different variables. Sometimes it's much more, depending on the precision of what you want. By the way, so this, this construction, by the way, uh, this does not really work uh, very well if what you do is what I just told you. Okay, so I'll, I will indicate the, the differences. This is, by the way, the organization of the questions. So the, the questions themselves are sort of a, to also a two-dimensional manifold, rather smooth, which is completely, why should it be like that? The reason it's like that is because I filtered the question. In other words, I related two questions to each other by how close they are, not just on individual, but how close they are on different demographic groups of individuals, okay? So two questions are linked to each other is they have a very strong similar similarity of responses in a, say, in the, in the dysfunctional group or in another group, uh, and so on. So uh, by doing this, I'm blurring the distinction between people. So for example, if I really wanted to uh, to also, to, to also blur the distinction between questions, I will just ask, is this question relevant for discriminating between uh, sort of crazy people and healthy people or something like that, or dysfunctional or functional? And so there will only be one parameter because dysfunctional and functional is a one parameter thing. 
So the, the manifold of questions would be essentially one dimensional. So what I'm really trying to tell you is building a manifold or organizing data by, by graphs or something is a highly <coughs> subjective uh, task, right? It's just as subjective as taking an image and filtering it or cleaning it or smoothing it or doing any kind of operation on it. You do it because you have something in mind and you tune it for that to, in order to achieve certain, uh, certain predict, uh, predictive power. So let's look at this. So for example, here in this geom, by the way, this whole organization was done without reading a single question, okay? This is just the matrix of zero ones. And what happened here is, so here's a group of questions, which we will see. So uh, I find it hard to keep my mind on a task or a job. I'm certainly lacking in self-confidence. I have difficulty in starting to do things. Even when I am with people, I feel lonely much of the time. I've several times given up doing things because I saw too little of my ability. You see the point. But, so those questions were basically pulled out by the, the commonality of responses in different groups and in different, uh, in different places. So I, I didn't read them, okay? They, that's, that's a conceptual grouping. So what happens here is that, so the tree of the questions is really, uh, so this, uh, let me go down. So here is, by the way, another group of questions, which is, uh, I'm almost never bothered by pains over my heart or in my chest. I hardly ever feel pain in the back of my neck. I have very few quarrels with members of my family. So he is pain-free. So the point is, there are well-being questions. The other one is sort of self-confidence kind, kind of questions. And the groups are, are, are popping out. So this, this, as I said, this could have been Martian, or this could have been sensors, which I don't understand at all to begin with. Okay, and I want to get the view of, the, of how those sensors are organized. Our point of view, every question is a sensor, okay? And every collection of measurements of these different sensors on a, given, uh, on a given point or a given person is the observation of that person. We want to organize observations by similarity of, of their profiles and, and we want to organize this this way. So, Again, so this is the tree of questions. And when you look at the tree of questions, it's the same thing. I mean, you can actually uh, see, uh, so this is a collection of questions I had before. And you see all the people in this group uh, basically responded uh, yes, to the, or yes or no to those. And all the ones here responded the opposite way. And you can immediately identify the groups which are most strongly discriminated by this group of questions. So you have this transition of going from features to location, and location to features, and so. So here is an example uh, what happens. So this is a, a simple questionnaire on images, which has been substantially extended by, uh, by Gal uh, Mishne here, and I'll show you in a minute. But uh, so here is, is, a, is a silly thing. You, you basically take, so what is a questionnaire? You take a pixel, take the 11 by 11 square centered at the pixel, take the FFT of that, take the Fourier transform of that, and uh, just take the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient, okay? So you have 121 questions, and then uh, you build this uh, tree uh, on, the, on the questions, and you find, so they, uh, what you see on the, on the right here, it splits the data into two segments, which is the blue and the brown. You go one level below, uh, you see that uh, you see this spot here, which looks like that, and that corresponds to, to the spot over here, and, or, or maybe to, yeah, the spot over here. And, and you see the boundaries popping out. So there are four levels here, right? I mean, there are three levels of this. This is not a binary tree. So there are three levels below that, that that pop out, just based on, those, on, the, tr on the question tree uh, in, this, in this situation. Uh, here is a, another way of looking at an image as a questionnaire. Take a collection of filter banks. So this is what, what Gal was doing. Take a collection of filter banks, which are like brushlets, basically. And <coughs> it actually relates very closely to what Stefan was talking about this, this morning. And ask yourself, how is a, this zebra being uh, split by, 
by sort of the stat in this case by the, by the response of of the collection of filter banks or by the statistics of the response there are lots of ways of deciding what are the features you want to associate to a given pixel so you can when you start with the image here you can let's say you have uh, 60 filter banks you associate to a pixel uh, basically so you have a stack of 60 images and you can associate to the pixel basically the, the 60 values that you have. You can also look, look at the neighboring values, and so you'll have a large, larger, question, a larger list of, of questions. And then you can, you can organize that this way if you wanted to. <coughs> Another better, or, or if this is, involves some cheating, because we started out with the language. We started out knowing what are good questions to ask for the, for the zebra, right? But they're not very good questions to ask the background. And, and so in reality, you want the data to tell us what the questions are, and we can do that very easily uh, uh, too by looking at patches and organizing the statistics of the patches and, and building up something in the style of what Ronen was telling us yesterday, finding coordinates for the intrinsic, intrinsic coordinate for the graph, and those intrinsic coordinates can be viewed as questions, okay? So the eigenvectors of the graph of the pixels can be very well be viewed as questions. We, we've seen this also in the, in the preceding talk, that if you look at the eigenvector of some Laplacian on the picture, you can use the eigenvectors to process a picture. But then you can you view each eigenvector as a picture itself and as a, resp as a, as a response to the pixel, right? Uh, a way of thinking about it is that you have a graph and you have a, you have a point on the graph you can pull it up and think of the graph as being built up of springs. You pull out the point and you listen to the music, right? And what you'll hear is at that point, you will hear the different amplitude will be the eigenvectors at that point. And uh, I mean, the different uh, oscillation in time will be the eigen, uh, I mean, the different amplitude will be the eigenvectors. And in time, you'll get harmonics corresponding to the eigenvalue. Right. So you can listen to the graph or look at the eigenvectors, it's the same thing. So you can actually hear where you are at any location. And so if you have the picture, uh, you can actually listen to the picture if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, I think nobody have done, has, has really done it this way, although we did it at some point to detect cancer. But you can listen to the picture at various points. And, or you can actually look at the eigenvectors as a way of questioning the, question, the, the picture. And that, that's a direct, uh, direct extension of what we heard in, in, the last, uh, in the last talk. Let me just say this. I've, just, I've taken a matrix, which is a, I viewed the matrix as a database, but the matrix did not have to be a database. The matrix could have been the matrix of some complicated transformation that I want to simplify, okay? So uh, <clears throat> just to illustrate, it could have been the matrix of acoustic scattering in this kind of body here, right? And you want, so which is given by this kind of transformation. I, I, if I discretize it, it'll be the matrix of this. Uh, if I take X and Y points on the boundary, this would be this, this matrix here. And <clears throat> I want to organize that thing uh, I can do it in exactly the same way. So what is the questionnaire? The questionnaire is, is basically this. I have a point here. I have an acoustic source out here. And, and I listen to that source at every other point here. This is a one column of the matrix, or vice versa. So this questionnaire issue, every, every if you, you view a matrix as a source and receiver kind of situation, uh, <laughs> It's a database, right? I have a charge out here, an acoustic charge, and I, I listen to the uh, acoustic charge uh, at another point. So, so the issue is how do you get this thing organized? Again, it can be organized rather nicely, and it's, this object is not as difficult as it seems. Okay, let me, uh, rather than, I think time is, we are all ready for lunch, so let, let me just show you one thing here, if I can. Get it? Okay, here. So this is an example of a very natural image questionnaire. So what's, and I'll stop with that. So here's the story. This is 
a, pathology, a tissue slide of a pathology. So you, you, this is what trying to detect cancer in a pathology slide. So you take the slide, you put it under a microscope, except so the image is something like this. It's not a very big image. And at every pixel, you measure the spectral, uh, the spectral absorption of light going through that pixel. So you shine light underneath, and you measure at, in this case, only 28 frequencies, how much of the light is actually getting through. So you have a profile of 28 uh, absorption, prof uh, absorption spectra, if you wish, or you have 28 questions for each pixel here. Uh, in general, you could take uh, 256 or 1,000 uh, band and so on. The, the reason for that is that if you know the absorption profile of a pixel, you know the mix of proteins or tissue, tissue types, if you wish, uh, underneath, underneath at that pixel. So what you have is you have an image, you have this instrument, which you really don't care about. You care about the underlying biology. So problem number one is how do you annotate the image by biology? This is, in a way, what uh, Ronen was uh, discussing yesterday. But let's ignore that for the moment. Let's say I have the image. I interrogate the image with uh, <coughs> this, those, this uh, number of questions. And then, uh, so instead of a filter bank, a collection of filters or uh, others, this is really uh, physical questions. And then I ask, how do I organize the image when, again, if you wish, so every pixel is a person, and I organize the demographics of the pixels, right? And again, just like I described with people, you see this particular surface here, which we can turn around so you, you see it going through. And I, I can also change coordinates here. Uh, let me change this one. And so it changes its form and the picture changes. So what happened here is what I'm displaying on the left side, the image that I'm displaying, is really this image here. So bear in mind, every point here is a pixel in the coordinates of the first three eigenvectors of the map of this, of this graph here. And basically every point, if I want to display the whole database, this whole surface that I see here, uh, the nice thing is that here, this is a display in RGB, right? I have three eigenvectors. One is red, one is green, one is blue. Uh, there are three coordinates here, and every point here has a, it corresponds to one pixel, so it's colored. And the, the tissue that I have is like that. The segmentation corresponding to a collection of questions or, or the level of the trees that I have are the, this segmentation here. And this is and there's a collection of questions. This is a display of the response of those questions on the, on the particular pixels uh, everywhere in the image, right? So I took, you look at the questions which have the strongest response, and you display this, uh, you display that here. So you have the ability to uh, <coughs> organize the pixels by the responses, look at the group of responses, which is part of the Respond to the, 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 the question tree, and see how does this group of responses uh, reflect, how does it see the actual image in there? Now, if you were to do it with the filter banks, you would have obtained in the zebra, for example, different positions of the stripes and stuff of that sort. But I think, I think it's enough. The point is, there's a whole machine. The distinction between images or text documents or psychological profiles or, or radar measurements or EGs is, is non-existent. It's all under the same machine. There's a lot of analytic machinery behind it, uh, which is complete extension of what's happening in, in, our, in our end uh, that is being used. I think I'll stop here. I think we are all hungry. Thank you.